on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. I feel very at home in China, and I really just love to be with the people. I have developed just really strong friendships there, and I think that it's really come from really learning and respecting and this mutual growth. I truly enjoy seeing the development and being a part of that energy that you see there and in contrast to that energy that in some ways serenity so to go to the temple of heaven where you see groups of individuals in dance and song and playing games and and being able to just join in on that and see that excitement that's also artistic Kelly Ottman is a professor in the Radar School of Business in the Milwaukee School of Engineering, known as MSOE. She teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in leadership, strategic planning, team development, and organizational behavior. Kelly developed and leads the Doing Business with China program in which engineering students undergo 11 weeks of classroom preparation that culminates in a 12-day working tour of China. She is a leadership coach providing consultation to local and international executives. In this episode, we explore doing business with China, the concept of Guanxi, clarifying mission and vision, and finding joy in purpose. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Kelly, welcome. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Kelly, you are a professor in the Radar School of Business at the Milwaukee School of Engineering, also known as MSOE. How would you describe your university? Yeah, our university is about 100 years old. It was really designed to meet the needs of the community, the working community, specifically the engineering, the, the manufacturing. And so it's a engineering-based university. However, it's extended to really look at technology from nursing, from business, from entrepreneurship. So it really serves that larger community. Kelly, what is your area of focus? I primarily focus on really the scholarship of teaching and learning. And as part of that is really looking at how the learner learns. And in my particular case, I look at how do they conceive participation and their engagement in the classroom? How do they learn what creates a good learning environment for them? And what I really found is it's that relationship between the learners and the instructor as well as the environment that's created through that. And what classes do you actually teach? Yeah, I primarily teach graduate education and I teach in the area of leadership, organizational development, and culture. And when you teach these courses, what is it that you want your students to learn? I really want them to learn about themselves. So if I look at organizational behavior, it's who are they? What's important to them? What's their value set? And how does that then influence when they start working with groups, when they lead groups? How does that influence the power their leadership style, and then what does that mean when they're working within organizations? How do they influence the organization? What's a good organizational fit for them? And how can they be successful? And if they're successful, ultimately the organization will be successful. Kelly, you've said that you want to teach engineers that gray is a color. What do you mean by that? 
many of the individuals I work with have come from a technical background, and so the world tends to be black and white. And what I've learned is that really teaching them that gray is a legitimate color, that they're and that also there's variations of gray that are equally valid, that they can start looking at the world and seeing that through the current realities of the situation and understanding that what is appropriate in scenario one might not be appropriate in scenario two or with person A versus person B. Is teaching engineers any different than teaching anyone else? I don't know that it's any different. I think that it's really the foundation that you're working off of. And so for engineers, they come to the table with a very logic-driven background. And I think that it's working off of that and helping them also to appreciate and respect their intuition the and empathy of other individuals that might not have been focused on as much in their undergraduate education. Is there a particular strength that engineers bring to leadership? Most definitely. They look at the world from a very systematic perspective, and I think that that does add a lot to the leadership perspective. Kelly, you are also involved in faculty development. What is it that you are seeking to develop in faculty? Yes, this is a new role for me, although I think I've always been doing this as a mentor throughout my years of teaching. I think it's helping faculty to really engage with the learner and to help the faculty develop them as a whole learner. One, you have to recognize where they're at. What are their strengths? Because if you go in just with a, an agenda that you're going to teach them to redesign all of their classes, that's just not going to work. And so with everything, it's understanding the perspective that the faculty has right now, their strengths, what they hope to accomplish in the classroom, and then helping them to see and appreciate how they might extend it to look at it from the student's point of view, as well as uh, what employers might be looking at in the future. Oftentimes that's, for us at MSOE, it's very experiential. It's collaborative with community partners. Right now, I do a lot of work with community partners and not-for-profits that help expose our students to a very different population than what they've been involved with in the past so that they increase their empathy and understanding of a very diverse world. I think it's also, for us at MSUE, it's helping to develop the whole person through character development, and uh, that requires self-reflection of the student, but it also requires self-reflection of the faculty member. Kelly, much of the work you are doing is helping prepare students to lead in a global world. How does cultural immersion help with leadership development? Yeah, I think that right now we are operating in a world that is very global. And each individuals, when they enter the workplace, and even before that, are interacting and being influenced, whether they like it or not, by companies, corporations, countries around the world. And so as leaders, appreciating the global mindset, I think, is imperative. Without that, we tend to be very ethnocentric. We tend to be very U.S.-centric. And that might not serve us well in the future. Kelly, in 2007, you led a cohort of engineering students to China. What was the purpose of that visit, and how did it come about? My first encounter with China was being assigned to teach a leadership class to emerging leaders within China. They came from the private sector, from Mo Motorola, from the public sector, from the government, as well as from corporations within China. And this was a rare experience that I got to work with these individuals as they were learning about leadership, learning about themselves, and learning about globalization from the U.S. perspective. 
What was wonderful about that is it also emerged me into understanding the Chinese culture because I really spent a lot of time learning about that, but then really learning through the students. That really propelled me to have this interest with China. Then when I came to MSUE, I developed a doing business with China program. And that was really designed to help develop global leaders here at MSUE and develop that global mindset. It was also to develop that leadership development through understanding issues of culture, history, business, economics, and how those all intersect. And that we can't just learn business. And in fact, at the beginning, I think I focused more on business. And what I've learned over the years is that if you just focus on business and you don't really understand the culture, the business won't be successful. Kelly, I noticed that the name of the program is Doing Business with China as opposed to Doing Business in China. Actually, it changed. So when I started this program, it was Doing Business in China. And it was set that corporately we were having a lot of products um, manufactured in China and importing them. It was cheap labor. And so it was really doing business in China. And it almost felt like the U.S. was telling China what to do. And I think that we've really advanced, and China particularly has advanced. And as a result of that, it's really about understanding the relationship of the U.S. and China and the relationship of the U.S. and China and the rest of the world and how they are all interrelated. And without that understanding, I don't think that we can be effective. Kelly, what are the elements of the Doing Business with China program? How is the program structured? It's structured that for 11 weeks, the students, and these are primarily graduate students that are working professionals, they learn about business through our partnership with about 20 different corporations. And we bring in guest speakers that are experienced with China to help them learn about China through a case study model. And that case study model we use the corporation, we learn about the corporation, and then we learn about a particular topic, such as market stratification. So we partner with GE Healthcare, uh, for instance, and we learn about GE Healthcare, but then specifically we learn about how GE has market stratification from the U.S. to China, and then now China to the rest of the world. But we really use that case study. So the students learn about China, China culture, and China business as a foundation. And then when we go to China, we're really able to deep dive. And again, we learn not necessarily just through tours of these companies, but through interaction. So I'll go back to GE. We partner with GE Healthcare and their emerging leaders and do a cross-cultural exchange where their leaders educate us and we educate them about emerging cultural issues that would be important for emerging leaders to understand. We also learn in very interesting ways. So we learn about business and leadership through doing Tai Chi in the Temple of Heaven. And that really teaches us about how do you make it look easy when it's really not, when it's difficult. And how does that also teach us about the history of China as it relates to what's the history of Tai Chi and how does that interrelate with the culture of China? So that's one example of very many where we really do non-traditional emerged learning. Is there a common response your students have to China? We can learn about a lot about China, but... It's really once they are emerged in it, and we take, for instance, public transportation. So you can learn about that there's 1.4 billion people in China and that one in five individuals in the world are from China. But it's not until you're on a subway, jam-packed, where you can't move, that you really understand, wow, that's what a lot of people feels like. And so it's really that immersion into the culture 
that we start to see that, as well as when we start to move from the Beijing and Shanghai to the rural areas, which is another part of our program. What do your students commonly say when they reflect on their experience in China? Most often they'll reflect on our signature piece of China, which is really our servant leadership project that we do in rural China. We have partnered with the Library Project, which is a not-for-profit operated out of Xi'an, China, and we build libraries in rural schools throughout China. And I've had the opportunity to really go to Inner Mongolia, the Gobi Desert, Chengdu, Changsha, and uh, very rural areas. And as part of that, really see maybe what true China is like. And I think that's what the students reflect on the most, is that dichotomy between the developed areas and the rural areas where most of the individuals have emerged from uh, when they're going to the cities. And so they really understand the motivations, the history, the culture, when you start to go to the rural areas. Our signature piece really allows us to interact with school children in a rural area. Most of these school children uh, go to school in a school that has no running water, no electricity, no heat, and no books. So we bring them books that are provided through the library project. But we also get to spend a day interacting with them, playing with them, teaching them, and they teach us, as well as we get to go to and sponsor three children that have economic needs and high academic potential. And spending time with their families in their homes, you get to really understand the fabric that is found part of the foundation of where China is today. How's your Chinese? I don't speak Chinese. Part of my goal is to help leaders be prepared to operate in this global world, which means that next week your boss could tell you, you need to go to X, Y, Z. There is no way you are going to learn the language and be proficient in a week or two. And so how do you operate? How do you navigate a foreign land when you don't know necessarily the language? How do you get from here to there? And so that's part of actually the experience is understanding how to do that. In fact, the students are tasked with taking charge of logistics. They are. And so as part of the library project, it becomes this international project management. I do not coordinate any of that besides create the linkages to the library project, but they have to understand their customers, the students, understand the environment, understand uh, what they need to secure, fundraise, market for this. They need to raise about $5,000 to support this. And then they have to execute. And execute means that they have to help secure transportation. And when we're in China, they are responsible for all public transportation. I tell them, we are going to XYZ place, and you're responsible for getting our tickets, figuring out how to get there, and navigating us from here to there. What I've really found is that that is terrifying for many of them. Not only are they doing that in a foreign country, they don't speak the language, but they're also responsible for a group of 12 other individuals who are relying on them. And once they've navigated that and have been successful, their confidence skyrockets. In fact, I just had a group of alumni come and talk to the new class that's preparing for this, and they all spoke about how this puts them way out of their comfort zone, and yet through those successes, they feel like they can transfer this to many different things in life. And And I think one of the key aspects of this is they also recognize that their world is bigger than what they've anticipated or have envisioned it. And so their world expands exponentially to see that their possibilities of how they could make a difference and where they could possibly travel to and have impact is much greater than before they start this program. Kelly, there is a word in Chinese, guanxi. What is guanxi? Yes, guanxi is really 
the foundation to how everything operates. We don't actually have a U.S. or an English word that translates directly to Guanxi, but it is interrelationships. It's the connections between people that make things happen. Oftentimes, we think about it in a very simple form as a friendship, but it's more than that. In order to do business, you need to have a relationship with the person that you're doing business. And that's not just about knowing what their company is and the demographics of their company, but it's really about knowing who they are. And through that knowing who they are, business occurs. Now, there's an upside to Guanxi in that you have that relationship and that extends to other things. So in China, business is not just separated. We're doing business and now we have our personal life. They are all intertwined together. The downside is they are all intertwined together. So oftentimes how you get jobs, how you get things done is all related to Guanxi. Guanxi is really the primary way this program is so successful because it's really from those initial students that I taught that I have been able to really understand business but also do business and have the students learn in China, i.e., when I go to China, I put a call out and I have still stayed connected with those 20-some students that are now leaders of some of the top companies and emerging companies in China. And as a result of that, they now teach the students that I bring to China. And they extend that Guanxi. So Guanxi is a transferable, meaning because I have Guanxi with these emerging students, the students that I bring now also have that Guanxi with them, and it's extended to them. It's also creates a responsibility for the students that I take that they understand that the only way that this program happens is through Grand Chi. And so they become ambassadors to the future students by representing themselves well and engaging the leaders that we meet in China. They also understand what Guan Chi is about as they return home. And so it has created a really strong alumni network of over 110 graduate students that have traveled to China over the years. And I think that has really become a a great benefit to the program as they are now teaching other students. Kelly, how do you think students have been transformed by their experience in China? There is a concept that's called threshold concepts or portal learning, which really indicates that people are transformed and it's irreversible and it, it it's not always easy. And so if I can share one story, and it's one that one of many stories, but on a recent trip to China, there was a gentleman who was a really strong engineer and really prided himself in just being a really strong engineer technically. And As he went on this trip and when we were at the library project, he happened to see this little girl. This little girl sat with him at lunch and then he was assigned a classroom to teach and the little girl was there and this little girl just caught his attention. And he had just actually become a dad to a little girl and I think that that was something that resonated with him. And then as we continued on throughout the day, he had little interactions with this girl. And then once we moved to the homes, I didn't know that he had had these interactions with this little girl. And I asked him, could you please present the gift to the family, a gift of some school supplies and some monetary gifts? And he saw this community and he saw the mother who was a single mother And he had such respect for this mother and this little girl. And this mother wanted more for her little girl. He saw that and he choked up. And it was really hard for him to present the gift. And he just started to to cry through it. And he felt very embarrassed by that. And on the way back, we were on a path 
and we were walking and he came up to me and he was talking about that and he he started to joke about that like you know it was a joke that he was got emotional and I was like wait you need to honor that that's so important that you felt that and he said I'm I'm not supposed to feel that as an a, an engineer I wasn't trained to have those emotions to express those emotions that's not what I was trained to do and what feels comfortable for me to do and we really had him sit in this this space of feeling all of those emotions and then he wrote his reflection paper on that transformation that he really saw that now his role as a leader was to connect with people, not just from the technical, what do you need to get done, but from the emotional and have empathy and create those connections where feelings are allowed. And it was amazing to see him a few months later and to watch him engage with others at a much different level and then to see him a year later and to have him talk about this experience and how it transformed him, those are the things and those are the reasons why I keep going back to China is because that transformation has a much larger domino effect than I can ever imagine. Kelly, how many times have you been to China? I've been to China 11 years. My first trip to China was in 2007. And how has China changed in those 11 years? It is astounding how it has changed. I tell the students, this is what you'll experience. And I also tell them, this is what I experienced last year. And the expectation is you might experience something completely different, even if we go to the same place, because the growth is phenomenal. So, for example... The first year I went, I went outside of Xi'an, which is where the terracotta warriors are located. And I remember driving on a dirt road. And then the following year, I came back. And they had built, as part of building infrastructure, a four-lane highway. However, only Two lanes of those were being used, and there were very few cars on it. The other lane, the other set of lanes, were being used to dry wheat. Now, I went back actually a year later, and that four-lane highway was packed with cars. And so that just illustrates the tremendous growth of technology and wealth and what that means. It also means that I've seen that it, from a technology perspective, in some cases, because the growth is so profound, they have leapfrogged expectations. So in areas such as sustainability, China has been criticized for its pollution. However, because of that and because of the policies and the government and if they focus on something, they're going to get it done. They have really enhanced and surpassed many parts of the world as it relates to green technology, green technology particularly in automotive development. And their policies help so that that can push it faster than what we can see in other places. What do you think people should know about China that they don't? I think, in fact, I have the students do a pre-survey and they need to share their images of China before they learn anything about China. And I think that there has been and continues to be this image of China that is that they're not as developed as what they really are. It's an old image of China. And because China is developing so rapidly, I think that the image of China hasn't kept up. And so when students go to China, they start to recognize, wow, it used to be that we had our manufacturing there because it was cheap labor. And so there was hundreds, thousands of people in the manufacturing site. And now that same site, going back to it, has become automated. 
And so we're not seeing the same images that we saw before. I think also a part of China that maybe is the underside or the side that we don't know a lot about is that censorship. And so censorship really is a part of doing business in China, is understanding that the Chinese have limited access to some of the materials that are in the rest of the world. So with all of the advancements, we see that China is able to really develop in areas and take what has been produced in other parts of the world and recombine it into new things. So for instance, they have what's called WeChat. And WeChat is an integration of what we would have here as texting, phone, Skyping, Facebook, and all of those other types of social media all in one. And then they've added that that's how you pay for everything. So with one app, if you will, everything gets done. That provides such great convenience and works really well. But there's another part to that, which is it's also monitored by the Chinese government. And so now the Chinese government is looking at social credits, which they look at, are you a good social citizen or are you going against the social norms? And they can do that through an app such as that, which also monitors what are you purchasing. And so the implications of that are starting to be seen as they're rolling that out. And so with every great advancement, there might also be some things that we're not necessarily as aware of that may be an implication. Kelly, what is considered good leadership in China? I think it's an integration of both the East and the West. So the East has a lot of its culture built into that. And so you'll see hierarchy and you'll also see this notion of collaboration and collectivism. And so really working together and looking out for the other person is built into the social fabric. And as a result of that, as a leader, Sometimes they're even referred to as the uncle, the aunt. And you're responsible not just for that worker when they walk into the door, but you're responsible for that person. And what does that mean? How do you help develop them? And so good leaders in China really have that more holistic view of leadership and their responsibility and their relationship in some ways, it goes to that guanxi with the employees. And so I think that that is a benefit. Now, interestingly, you still have that hierarchy. So as much as you see this almost servant leadership type model that you're developing the other, you know the other, it still has a hierarchy and face which is uh, protecting one's reputation, is still built into leadership. So as a result of that, the leader oftentimes isn't questioned, oftentimes has more of an authoritative type, as we would see from the West, perspective. And so it's this interesting relationship of East and West there. I think that as they've integrated more aspects into the Chinese leadership, you're seeing aspects of the emotional intelligence, for instance, which is very reflective and has been a part of the culture in the past, and it's now reemerging and framed maybe in emotional intelligence. How do I understand myself as a leader? So a lot of the leaders that I interact with and work with now in China are very concerned about their own development and self-reflection and spending time in understanding who they are and how that influences their leadership. Kelly, the 20th century has been called the American century. Is the 21st century the Chinese century? It just might be. You look at just the development and the strategies that the Chinese have put into place, 
China really would like to reemerge as that world leader. If you look way back into history, they were the leader. They had the Silk Road. They were innovators. They developed gunpowder and uh, mathematics and the compass. And so you see all of that, and they really that have that long-term vision that allows them to take that pride that came from the past and reemerge in the future. I think that their strategy, if you look at The Art of War by Sun Tzu, is an important one. It's really understanding the weaknesses of the enemy. And if we're the enemy, I'd hate to see us as the enemy, but we are their competitors. And so if you frame it as a competitor, you continue to grow and excel in the future. Kelly, when you are in China, what do you enjoy most to do? I feel very at home in China, and I really just love to be with the people. I have developed just really strong friendships there, and I think that it's really come from really learning and respecting and this mutual growth. I truly enjoy seeing the development and being a part of that energy that you see there. And in contrast to that energy, that in some ways serenity. So to go to the temple of heaven, where you see groups of individuals in dance and song and playing games and and being able to just join in on that and see that excitement that's also artistic. Kelly, I'd love to talk about this life that you've led that has led you to travel the world. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. It's along Lake Michigan. It's a small German community. What do you remember about Sheboygan growing up? Sheboygan was where my family was. I grew up where family was very close. They were our friends. We spent all of our time together. I'm proud to have grown up in Sheboygan. It kind of provided a strong foundation to my development. And your mom and dad? Uh, my mom uh, was a stay-at-home mom, and her world centered on her children and her church and her family. And she really believed in her children being able to explore life and grow and develop. My father, he worked in a manufacturing company, and then he had his own used car lot. And so... He was a social person as it relates to his work as a car lot manager. What was formative about your childhood? Yeah, if I look back, I think the middle school years were critical to me, and I think I'd, I'd highlight a few things. One was when I was in middle school, we didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't grow up with resources whatsoever. And traveling meant to go to the campground that was seven miles away from my house, and that's where we spent our vacations. However, my family invited individuals from literally around the world into our home as a way for us to learn about the world. And at one particular time when I was in middle school, I became very ill and I was confined to bed for a, almost a month. And at that time, we had a gentleman uh, who was a pastor from the base of Mount Kimilanjaro in Tanzania, Africa. And he sat by my bed and he told me stories of his village, of his family, of the lions that would come to his village. And I remember just sitting and listening to his stories and recognizing that the world was so much bigger than the world that I grew up in. And that it was really about listening to what was important to him and the possibilities that that presented. I think also another formative aspect was kind of finding myself. So when I was in middle school, all of my friends wanted to be cheerleaders. 
I didn't really want to be a cheerleader, but they were all going to be cheerleaders. And if I was going to be part of the crowd, I tried out to, to be a cheerleader too. And I got to be a cheerleader. Unfortunately, my friends didn't. And that really put me in a really difficult situation. But it also made me really reflect on, why do I do things? What's important to me? And it's okay not to do what everybody else does. And I think it really pushed me to have that comfort and pride, after I left being a cheerleader, I should note, in being who I was and that unique identity based on what I believed in my values. And I think that that's been an ongoing journey for me throughout the years is that continued time of reflection to say, what's important to me? And, and am I doing this because it's expected of me? Or am I doing this because this is really what I want to do? And that's played out with, do I want to work as a, a working mom? Do Where do I go to school? Can I go to school when people tell me I can't go to school? I shouldn't go to school? So it's really played out throughout my life. I think another thing is we lived with my great-grandmother. As I said, we didn't have resources, and so we lived with my great-grandmother, and we took care of her, and she provided a house for us. And when she passed away when I was 13, I remember that that left a void, and it also left a bit of a guilt because our final parting was maybe not as joyous as what I would have liked. And so I started volunteering to fill that at a nursing home. And from there, started to take some of my interest in art and crafts. And I developed a class called Crafts with Kelly. And so every week I would adapt craft items and teach individuals who were in the nursing home how to do those. Why they let a middle school and high school person do that, I have no idea. But that became formative for me because when I went to college, I wanted to be a recreational therapist because of that experience. I wanted to help individuals find joy in life again when they might not be able to do it the same way because now they've had a stroke. So those are some of the things that I think were really formative in those middle school years that have remained with me today. Kelly, you mentioned that you became interested in helping people find joy. Why was that important to you? It was something I think that I learned as I started working with individuals is that we have this sense of identity and what's important to us. And oftentimes that comes not necessarily just from our work, but from the, our avocational activities, the things we do for fun. And what I recognize is when you take those away from someone or because they're now in a situation where they no longer can go bowling or go skiing or trap shooting or whatever it is that they find as a point of joy, changes their perspective on themselves. And so I found that if I can help individuals find new ways to do this, to do the things that they enjoyed, it brought them joy again. And it also helped them to understand what's important to them as they reconsidered some of those aspects of what they did. Because oftentimes, as a therapist, when I became a, a recreational therapist, it was really understanding the core of what's important to a person and then trying to re-envision that as they move to the future given the changes sometimes those things that are very abrupt to them such as I worked for a period of time in a spinal cord injury center rehab center those injuries are really abrupt so overnight my world's turned upside down and it's understanding what's really important from my past that I can carry into my future. Have you been sensitive in your own life about finding joy? Actually, joy is my word for the year. And Brene Brown talks about that joy is one of the hardest emotions to experience. And as I've really reflected on that, I somewhat agree in that 
it requires us to be vulnerable, to find that joy, to trust in the now, and that, and, and to really experience joy, you have to let go of some of the past and also fears of the future. After studying therapeutic recreation in college, what did you do afterward? Yeah, so I was a recreational therapist. I did my training at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, and then Freighter Hospital was opening a spinal cord unit, and I was on the design team for that spinal cord unit, and they really wanted to be innovative. And so as a recreational therapist, I really got to design and take risks to help individuals right after their injury to engage in adaptive activities. And we also required that individuals needed to re-enter the community five times before they could leave the safety, if you will, of the rehab center. And so that required us to go really on many adventures with each of the patients because you never know what to expect. And I think that that was a, a great background for them is to understand that you, you, can't, you need to prepare before you enter into this new world, meaning going shopping or going, on, going to the restaurant or going on a date or whatever that was, but you can't prepare for everything. And I think that that's also something I learned is that you can't prepare for everything and you have to be flexible and be a little bit vulnerable also to really experience the moment. I did that for a while and I loved being a therapist. And then I recognized I wanted to make a larger difference in the healthcare world. So I went back to school for health administration, public policy and public administration at Madison. It was a trio degree. And as part of that, I had the opportunity to apply for a fellowship. And I applied for a fellowship where the requirement was they would not hire you after a two-year fellowship, which was a little risky. However, I recognized if they were preparing me to go out into a larger world, I expected they would prepare me well, and they did. They prepared me to be an executive. And so any unit that was lost its leader, I became the unit leader. Any big project that was taking place, such as building uh, new facilities, an ambulatory care center. I became a project leader on aspects of it. And that really taught me that it's not the technical that is the most important. It was really the human aspect, the conceptual aspect, the strategy, and particularly the leadership that made the difference. I needed to have a base of what is healthcare but it was really the other aspects of that that made one a good leader. Kelly, you served as a healthcare executive for many years. Healthcare administration is a challenging and lucrative field, and yet a time came when you left. Why did you leave? I did, and I loved my job, and I loved what I was doing and the difference that I was making. When I started as a healthcare executive, I decided I wanted to give back. It felt like I was in a really privileged position, and there weren't a lot of female leaders at that time. And so I felt like I needed to give back. So I started to teach, and I taught various topics. And then I started to realize I kind of like this. A good friend of mine who I co-taught at Marquette with, he actually had worked with Mother Teresa and encouraged me as part of my teaching leadership to look at my own leadership and sent me on a mission and vision, what do you want to do when you grow up next process. And so I went away to a cloistered monastery on the West Coast near the Big Sur in California and spent some time in self-reflection. I actually did that multiple times. I not only went to a cloistered monastery, which I have to say is painful for me because I process through talking. And so to be cloistered for a period of time was really painful, but pushed me to really do that self-reflection. I also spent time at a Buddhist 
monastery, a Zen monastery. And all of those experiences helped me to really look at what's important. What are the core values that I hold most dear? And how do I want to live that as I continue in life? And so I decided through that process, it did not happen overnight, uh, that I would eventually leave healthcare and I wanted to teach. I saw that as therapist, as an administrator, teaching was a part of what I did. It was a thread that went through every single th aspect of my life. And so to really hone in on that, understand that, and then be able to teach others about leadership and hopefully help them to make a difference in the world, that is what I wanted to do. It took for a while for me to prepare for that. I needed to figure out where I was going to school, make sure my finances were in place. So it didn't happen overnight. And it was a difficult transition, but an exciting one. Kelly, you did draft a personal mission and vision statement, and it's been clarified over the years. I was wondering if you might read it. Yeah, it has. In fact, I first wrote it in 1996 was my first draft, and I revise it. I take time every year to look at it, and I have to say it hasn't necessarily changed all that much over the years. And so, yes, my personal mission and vision for reflection, direction, and transformation. To live each day as a gift from God and to rejoice in the opportunities that it provides to reflect on the past and grow from it. To savor the joys of the moment and be spontaneous within them and to plan for a future full of purpose and peace. To gently touch the individuals, my children, family, friends, clients, students, and strangers that I encounter with rays of optimism, empathy, and integrity to aid in their individual growth potential, which will come full circle and contribute back to my growth, to cherish the past while seeking better ways in the future through the gifts I've been given, my time, talents, and money, and to honor my individuality and my needs not society's expectations, as I learn and continue to grow as a person, a mom, a professional, and a member of society. Through all of this, I will seek balance and synergy and focus on the importance to achieve the above while creating a positive and meaningful legacy. Kelly, examining your core values led to a period of difficulty in your life. It did, and... That led to my very intentionally leaving something I really loved, which was my job, and entering this new world of education. It also became the place that I left a large, well-known institution that I had been at for seven years, and I left that to come to a smaller private institution, MSOE, but it fit my values because here I can work with a smaller group of individuals and really connect with them on a personal level. It also became a rock for me because after 25 years of marriage, I found myself unexpectedly one day realizing I was not going to be married any longer. And it rocked my world. I could hardly breathe. And yet when I thought, well, my world's fallen apart and what is my identity, I really needed to go back to my purpose. And part of my purpose, as I looked at that, I recognized that being a wife was not the centerpiece of my identity. I was so much more. And those things that I was will continue and to continue to grow in the future. And so it's helped me with the plan change and the challenges, the letting go the death and dying process of changing a job or moving to the death and dying process when it's something that's unexpected. Kelly, you are a professor who helps develop student leaders by traveling to other places and immersing yourself in different cultures. Are you still involved in a form of therapeutic recreation? Yeah, I think that aspects of that will continue to be a part of my life. I still volunteer and love to spend time in 
nursing homes. My mother resides in a long-term care facility, and so it is joyful to spend time there and interact with her and others. I think that aspects of that as far as really looking at what is the core of an individual and what's important to them and helping them reach their full potential, which is my purpose, really emerged from those early days as a therapist. I think one of the things that I learned as a therapist was oftentimes it's also showing them that they can't do something the way that they did it before. And oftentimes that produced an anger as they reflected upon what they had to give up and their losses as they were journeying to the future. And I think that that's also true as I work with individuals from all different walks of life as a executive coach to an educator, holding up that mirror for individuals, sometimes there are things that, that, that are painful to look at, that are painful current realities, that are also painful that they need to let go of. To move into the future, sometimes we have to let go of part of the past. And that's not always easy. And so those lessons and being comfortable at times as an educator, as executive coach, as a consultant, maybe people might not like me at that moment, but sometimes that's okay as long as I don't lose sight of the integrity and the values that I bring to it. Kelly, what matters most to you? Living with purpose and integrity and being wise in that process and using purpose to be thoughtful in living out daily life as well as the big things in life. Um, sometimes things happen to us and we don't necessarily, we can't prepare for that. And then there's also things that we plan. So taking on a new job, I can plan for that. And I can do that through my purpose. There's other things like a death or other things that happen in life that we can't plan for. And yet, how do we still see who we are and grow through that process? Thanks for your time today, Kelly. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Kelly Ottman is a professor in the Radar School of Business in the Milwaukee School of Engineering. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Therapeutic Recreation at the University of wisconsin La Crosse and a Master's of Public Administration in Healthcare Administration and Public Policy, and a PhD in Organizational Leadership and Adult Education from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And now, a personal word. I have not been to China. I would love to go. It seems the 21st century is in rapid development there. I imagine this is how many people viewed America in the 19th and 20th centuries. This burst of ambition and energy recasting possibility. There are differences between the two nations that seem profound. America was and remains, in comparison, an infant nation populated by immigrants. We are, or mostly have been, a democratic, capitalist society. Our politics are riotous on the surface and stable underneath. Our institutions work based on consent. China is a modern and ancient place at once. Chinese traditions and culture are thousands of years old. For nearly its entire history, China has been suspicious of foreigners. Today, it is a Marxist, capitalist society. It is a one-party communist state in which politics are firm on the surface and troubled underneath. Kelly Ottman takes her students to China to meet with Chinese and American business people. They build relationships. They experience culture. They manage logistics. They participate in servant leadership projects, and they challenge their own perceptions. They develop and appreciate Guanxi, the social bonds that facilitate business and personal dealing. In addition, Kelly teaches courses on organizational behavior, management, and team dynamics. She has her own practice coaching executives. She is leading faculty development in her college, 
furthering her scholarship of teaching and learning. She is doing all this work after seriously considering a mission and vision for her life. Kelly finds joy in the purpose of her work and further joy and purpose in exploring purpose and joy. There is a connection between what she considers and who she is. There always is, for all of us. We are what we think about most of the time. In an article entitled Ancient Chinese Philosophical Advice, Can It Help Us Find Happiness Today? Professor Guo King Zhang and Ruth Vinhoven explore the three main classic Chinese schools of philosophy, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, which all deal with the question of how one should live. The authors review the ancient recommendations of each tradition and consider whether they promise a happy life in modern-day society. They say classic Confucianism and Taoism offer the most apt advice as they are life-affirming philosophies. Confucianism emphasizes our relationship to family and community and the benefits of work, governance, rites, and rituals. Confucianism celebrates wellness and prosperity. Moral virtue and love of learning are elements that infuse Confucianism with action in this life. Well-being results from effort and merit. Taoism is a very different tradition, more of a religion, a metaphysical exploration, inviting us to follow the eternal Tao, the way of nature. It is not necessary to strive or to seek perfection of virtues. These efforts are vain and self-defeating. Instead of seeking material conditions of a good life, Taoism teaches our attention should be on our inner life. Our focus should be on being present, on reflection, on a freedom of spirit. Kelly Ottman expresses this duality. She is Confucian in that the quality of her life is hers to determine. She is dutiful and she strives. She is Taoist in that she knows that there is much in life outside our control. Things happen. With acceptance comes contentment. We are wise to see the connections. We are better when possibility is recast. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.